first operating system that CompTIA expects you to know for the A-plus exams is Windows 2000. Windows 2000 has the old familiar Windows look to it. There are a couple tools we're going to look at. First we're going to go to is the control panel which is accessible through the start menu, settings, and control panel, and all the applets will appear here. System will draw our attention first. At the system applet we can see five different tabs. The first is the general. None of the values can be changed directly on the general tab. It's simply showing you information coming out of the registry. What's key is it's showing you the system, the service pack that's installed, the license number, and various other information. Network identification lets you change the network ID and properties associated with it, such as the domain. Hardware has some very important icons to it here, buttons. First is the hardware wizard, letting you look for additional hardware that's been installed, the device manager, and the hardware profiles. Driver signing is new to Windows 2000, letting you choose what to happen when you come across a, a driver that Microsoft hasn't recognized. You can choose to ignore those, get a warning, or block them. You probably don't want to do ignore because that goes around all the rules of security. Warn would be the very minimum level you would want to do and block is highly recommended. The device manager will show us the devices that are installed. We can get additional information about them here. In this case we see we have one device which is questionable. We'll right click on it. We can choose to disable it or uninstall it. Look for changes. Let's drop down and look at the properties for it. In this case, it's an unknown device. It isn't sure what it is. If we know it's a working device, we can always reinstall the driver and try it again. The driver information will not be known, and the resources associated with it are available through the resources tab. There are no known conflicts, so that's not causing our problem there. Uh, let's choose another item. Let's say we want to look at our IDE drives. We'll take a look at the, the storage controller. We can uninstall it, search for changes, or look at the properties associated with it and get information. What's unique about Windows 2000 and the later operating systems is the troubleshooter, which is available for walking through most of the steps. Really, these are just wizards that will walk you through the most common errors and allow you to get the device up and running fairly quickly. Let's close out of the device manager. Look at our user profiles tab. We can see the users that are here. Change their type if we want them to be roaming or local, local being the default. And let's go to the advanced tab as well. The advanced tab has three key areas, performance, environment variables, startup and recovery. The easiest of the three is the environment variables, which simply shows us information coming from the old set parameters. What is our path? What type of processor do we have? What are all things that it's using to identify? The startup and recovery lets us choose which operating system will start up by default and how many seconds it will be before it times out to that choice. You can set that down so it will never time out if you want to, or you can make that a very short duration if you want to immediately boot up to that. If there is a system failure, ideally you want to write to the system log, possibly send an administrative alert and automatically reboot. You can choose what type of debugging information to write and where to write to. Small memory dump files do not give you the option to overwrite existing files. However, if we go down to a complete memory dump, which takes up a lot of space, you can choose to overwrite existing files there. Now key is the performance options. When we look at this, you can see that you can optimize this machine to have performance for the applications that you're running as you sit at it or for background services. If it is functioning as a server, you're going to want to optimize it for background services if you're using it as a regular desktop machine applications. Virtual memory allows you to choose how much space is available on the drives for that, set aside for it, and we can change those options here as well. One of the valuable fields is the registry size showing you the current registry size and the maximum registry size settings as well down at the bottom. This value can easily be overwritten and typed in. You want to look to see if your registry is growing too large. Typically it doesn't hurt to have enough breathing room here for that to get larger. The paging file size, you can change those values as well and it doesn't do any harm to leave those as small values except your performance will suffer. Setting this to a large value will set aside a contiguous space to use during the boot for the paging file. As the size grows, as the machine continues to run for a number of days without rebooting, you want it to write into contiguous space so that the performance continues to stay there. But again, all these values can be changed as needed. We're going to close out of the system properties 
and take a look at a couple of other tools over in the control panel. We've got the users and passwords allowing us to do, as the name implies, add additional users and passwords locally in this case. Scheduled tasks, um, our printers, which we'll look at later on for adding additional printers. Automatic updates for Windows updates and some administrative tools. In this case, our administrative tools for Windows 2000 include computer management and services. We're going to stop with the event viewer to begin with. And this shows us what's going on with this machine. When we looked at the system reboot, we could configure for it to write to the system log. This is the system log. So you can see the errors that are here occurring here, as well as just warnings and generic information as well. In this case, the generic information is telling us what's going on. The system booted, no big deal along those lines. Security log can tell us where security failures have occurred. And the application log can be written to by specific applications telling what's going on with those. Again, information, errors, and warnings are occurring in those logs as well. Let's go to the command line for a second. Take a look at a couple of values there. The first we have is we can run regedit, look at the registry editor. If we want to see what boots every time, what runs, I'm sorry, every time the machine boots, we'll look at HK local machine, software, Microsoft, come down to Windows, current version, and looking at this information we can see some keys, but run shows everything that runs each time, and run once will be what runs just the next time. In this case, we've got a migration which is going to occur with those drivers the next time this machine boots. If we want to see what happens each time this user logs in, the current user, we can go to HK Current User, Software, Microsoft, Windows, Current Version, Run and see what runs every time the user logs in or run once, what runs the next time this particular user logs in there as well. We'll exit out of that and we'll run ipconfig. You see our configuration information for the networking values, ipconfig all, see for all the values associated with it. We'll spend a little more time looking at that in Windows XP. One more tool we want to look at in Windows 2000, if we right click on the taskbar, we can choose Task Manager. That's one of the ways to bring this up and look to see what applications are running, what processes are running, ending any of the processes that shouldn't be there, as well as get a quick look at the performance of the machine. This is showing us the CPU usage as well as the memory usage and some other values. By minimizing this, all of a sudden we will have an icon appearing over to the right of the machine, which is actually showing our CPU usage. So this is a nice little graphic that can be left up there showing what's there, allowing you to quickly bring up Task Manager, make any changes that you need to. And that's our overview of Windows 2000. The second operating system that CompTIA expects you to know for the a exams is Windows XP. Windows XP has a number of different interfaces that you can use or ways to configure it. An easy way to do it is to right click on the start menu, choose properties, and you'll see that you can choose the classic start menu or the Windows XP style start menu as well as configure the taskbar. If you choose customize, you can add various items to the start menu including your old favorites like the administrative tools and such. You can also can remove those if you don't want a user to have certain things like the run command. We're going to leave those as they are, choose OK on that, and come back out to our interface. We are going to go to the control panel and system and see the information very similar to what we saw in Windows 2000. In this case, we've got a couple more tabs than what we had before by default. At the general tab, it's still identifying the system, telling us what service pack it has installed, and giving us very other, various other information coming directly out of the registry. The computer name is similar to what we saw with the network identification, allowing us to describe how the information is there and choose the network ID and change anything that we want to, such as the domain. Hardware shows us the device manager, driver signing and hardware profiles as we saw with the Windows 2000. It also has a button added for Windows Update, allowing us to easily connect and download the latest updated version of Windows. The Advanced tab, very similar to what we saw before. The Performance lets us choose whether we want to optimize for applications or for background. It also lets us choose the size to configure for the registry. 
user profiles are there, and the system startup and debugging information. Let's take a look at that one for a moment. If more than one operating system is installed, you can choose which one will be the default should you not make a choice at the boot menu. The time the boot menu will be displayed is the second item here. In this case, it's configured to five seconds. Down in the lower half, we have the system failure information. Ideally, we should write an event to the system log so we can see what is going on. You can choose to send an administrative alert, although typically when it's going down, there's not much time for it to do so. And ideally, you want it to automatically restart to come back up. Debugging information, in this case, it's choosing none. You can choose to do a very small memory dump a kernel memory dump or the complete memory dump. The most useful of all is the complete memory dump and I would recommend choosing that which writes to the memory DMP file. A key item here is the overwrite any existing file checkbox at the bottom. If you do not choose this option then it will continue to write them in sequential order and these files can get very very large. Make sure you have enough hard drive space before you leave that checkbox unchecked. We're going to go ahead and choose that and take a look at some of the other tabs that we have. System Restore is a new one to Windows XP. You can turn on System Restore and that will keep uh, journals, if you will, of where the system is, allowing you to go back to a particular point in time. So if you install a driver and that driver is causing problems, you can restore the system to where it was before that driver was installed. Automatic Updates, same thing as Windows Updates, only you can choose to have that done automatically. It will take care of it for you. And the remote tab allows you to configure two things, remote assistance and remote desktop. Remote assistance allows you to invite invitations from administrators and such to come in and help you with problems you're having. The remote desktop allows you to actually control the desktop remotely. This is ideal if you're working from home and need to access the computer. Windows Firewall will be configured to allow the remote desktop connection as well. I'm going to say OK to this and leave things as they are. Let's take a look at our registry settings. We're just simply going to choose the start menu, run, and type in regedit or regedt32 as you see at the bottom. The key thing about Windows XP is regardless of which one of those you type in, you're going to get the same tool. One is just an alias for the other. Here we're looking at the HKEY current user Microsoft software, Microsoft Windows current version run. This is anything that would run when just this user logs in. If we want to see what will run when any user logs in, we'll go to HKEY local machine, software, Microsoft, and we're going to go down to Windows current version. I'll stop here for just a moment and point out that much of this information is very familiar looking to you, hopefully. And then we've got the run. These are all the programs starting each time the computer is booted and run once. Nothing is configured to only run the very next time the system runs. We're going to go to run, look at the values there, and you'll see that in these values you can right click on them and choose to change the values, delete them, or rename them. The key to renaming them is that this list appears in alphabetic order and is executed in that order as well. If you need something to run first, you can rename it so that the name starts with an A. If you need it to run last, you can rename it so it starts with a Z. We'll leave those values as they are. We're going to open up a command prompt by using the CMD command and take a look at our network settings on this particular machine. IP config will give you the basic information showing the IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway. If we add the all option to it, we get a lot more information including the DHCP server and DNS server information. Key to note down at the bottom, the lease obtained and lease expired information. In this case, the lease expires on 8.56.50 on July 26th. We're going to go ahead and renew that using ipconfig. Other values also allow us to release it. And now our lease will expire at 9.05 because we've just renewed it for its duration. We'll exit out of that. And that completes what we need to look at for Windows XP for the exam study.